What's up, everybody? That's the sound we're always trying to avoid, the feedback sound. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw, I actually added the uh, the topic feedback uh, to that uh, pre-roll screen like in the last 30 seconds or something. Um, I think I need to do that in the future just so that you guys know uh, ahead of time during the pre-roll, you're like, oh, snap, yeah, that's something I care about. And if you don't care about it, you should tune in for the jokes. No? Okay. Um, yeah, I hope you guys are doing well. It's a Wednesday. Um, I'm actually getting ready to head to the beach as soon as this is over for, uh, for just a few minutes. So uh, that should be fun for me. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about feedback. It's not a thing that solid body electric violinists have to deal with a whole lot. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we usually pick solid body violins is so we don't have to deal with feedback. I know that it's definitely one of the reasons I switched to a solid body violin. In fact, I was just uh, chatting online with one of my first sound engineers, a guy named Bubba Wolford, is a fantastic sound engineer, a friend of mine in Texas. And uh, he was one of the, well, he was the first, first sound engineer I ever worked with. And uh, yeah, man, boy, did we battle through some feedback issues in the early days when I was trying to figure this electric violin thing out back in the back in the 1990s back before most of you guys were born um finally ended up with a viper uh oops, there we go like that one right there um finally ended up with a viper and i haven't dealt, dealt with feedback since um but a lot of you guys are working with acoustics with pickups or acoustic electric instruments and even if even if it's not an issue that you deal with with your violin you may deal with this issue with microphones, say like if you're a singer or you like to tell jokes or you're, uh, you know, you, you talk uh, between songs or whatever it is. If you've got a microphone on stage or you've got an acoustic violin somewhere on stage, whether it's got a mic or a pickup on it, um, you probably have to deal with feedback. So, um, yeah, I, this is a presentation I put together for. Um, another thing, it's, this is sort of a, you guys are, you guys can be my guinea pigs. I like that. Um, this is something that I put together for another thing. Oh, I do want to tell you guys, um, speaking of other things that are going on, MW Rock, the Mark Wood Rock Orchestra Camp is generally held in Olathe, Kansas every year. Obviously we're not all going to Kansas this year. Um, so it's being done online. MW Rock is virtual. Um, so I'm there in virtually, I'm there virtually, um, all this, all the same faculty, Mark Wood is there, Val Vagoda is there teaching songwriting this year, uh, Dr. David Wallace from Berkeley is there teaching composition, uh, Chuck Bontrager is there, uh, teaching effects, Joe Denizon is there teaching, um, how to do solo violin stuff, whether solo violin or solo with a looper, um, See who else is there? Uh, Leela Hood is teaching hip hop violin. Uh, Hayden Vitera is teaching how to do uh, a cover song and make it your own. Like, don't just try to sound like the record. Actually, you know, show some creativity. Uh, Hayden's teaching that. Uh, Matt Vanicoro is teaching uh, technology. Uh, Jordan Rudis from the band Dream Theater is there. He's teaching stuff. Um, I think who all else is there? I know I'm blanking on somebody, but the uh, the faculty is outstanding, and there are faculty concerts every night. And if you go to our Facebook page, the Electric Violin Shop Facebook page, not right now, when I'm done, you can go to the Electric Violin Shop Facebook page and find a link to where you can go check out those concerts. I can tell you this as a person who has been at the camp several years: the concerts are amazing. A may breathtakingly good concerts. Um, Alex Depew, Tracy Silverman, Joe D, uh, Chuck, Doc Wallace, all these people uh, um, are all playing concerts and they're going to be amazing. All except for mine. Um, so yeah, so you can go to, you can find the link on our Facebook page to buy tickets to these concerts. They're, they're cheap. Um, and uh, totally, totally worth it. So, uh, yeah, highly recommend that. Oh, and it, I don't know if it's too late to sign up. It's a two-week-long thing. We're only in, like, day three. Um, so if you're thinking, hey, gosh, I really would love to do this. And honestly, 
because you can attend several of these classes because it's all virtual. You don't have to go, oh, I want to be at Doc Wallace's class or Chuck Bontrager's class. You can do both. And just one of these class, and each one of them is teaching two classes because of two weeks. One class from one of these guys is totally worth the price of admission. The fact that you can do all of them and you can do one twice is muy bueno. So, all right, let's get on to, uh, let's talk about feedback. There I am in the corner. Hey, look at me. So yeah, how to stop feedback from pickups and mics. So the first thing we want to talk about is what exactly is feedback. And the way to do that, we got to start with how, the way I always like to talk about, don't just, hey, push this button, push that button. I want you to know why. Why something is happening. Uh, and that way, once you know why something is happening, you can, you know, you can be a little smarter about how to apply the tools to make that thing not happen. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about, just the basics, how does a PA work? There's an input, there's processing, there's amplification, and there's an output. So we've got all those things. Um, and here's a little drawing. If you're a drawing person, I like drawings, they always help me. So we got a microphone, that input goes into the mixer, or there's some processing there. Then it goes to the amplifier, then it goes to the speaker. Okay, what feedback is, is as all that starts coming around, if what's coming out of the speaker, say it's your voice coming out of the speaker, and then you're talking into the microphone, right? But if the microphone can hear you and it can hear what's coming out of the speaker, then it's going to try to make that louder, which means what comes back around through the speaker is even louder. And then it goes through and amplifies it again, and it's even louder, and it gets even louder, which is why a lot of times you hear feedback will start low and then take off. It'll start, and it takes off because it's a positive feedback loop. Hence the name, feedback. Um, so in order to stop feedback, we've got to interrupt or decrease the signal growth at any point in that cycle. So those are your four things again. Um, input, processing, amplification, output. We got it's, it's like the fire triangle. Remember you got your know, fuel, heat, and air. Uh, in order to make fire go away, you remove one of those three, your choice. Um, so in feedback, Input, processing, amplification, output. Those are the four things that are happening. If we can stop signal growth at any point in that cycle, we have eliminated feedback. That's a good thing. So the quickest and easiest way is in the amplification section. The quickest and easiest way to eliminate feedback is to turn down. That's it. That's the tweet. Turn down. If you turn down, the feedback will go away. You may have to turn down a lot, but turning down 100% eliminates feedback. 100% of the time, if you turn down, feedback goes away. You may have to turn down like to the point of off. Especially if feedback starts to take off, dump it. Just go straight to zero. The feedback will stop, and then you can start bringing it up slowly, and you can go, hey, putting it on the volume level of eight uh, gives me feedback. Let's go to zero. Make the feedback quick. Hey, let's try six. Nope, still feeding back. Okay, five. Okay, now we're juicy. So that's the quickest and easiest way. Turn down. Not always an option, especially if you're me, because I like to be loud. Um, so the next thing, so that was amplification. Input. We can change or move our input device. Those of us who play solid body Instruments, that's what we did. We changed our input device. I'm not going to put a microphone on an acoustic violin because I'm tired of fighting this thing. Um, so I just changed my input device. Boom, problem solved. The other thing you can do is you can move further away. If you're standing right on top of your speaker and it's feeding back, maybe now it won't. So you can, you can back up. Like I said, you can use a device that's less sensitive, like changing instruments. Or you could go to an acoustic electric instead of an acoustic with a pickup. So you're going to use a device that's less sensitive. You can change the angle. Change the angle. What the heck is that? Let's talk about this. Microphones have patterns. If we have a microphone problem, 
Microphones have patterns. So you see a cardioid pattern, supercardioid pattern, omnidirectional. What the heck does all that mean? Okay. So if you look at these three-dimensional drawings, two-dimensional drawings of a three-dimensional thing, okay, let's clear that up, um, then what you see is you'll see where the, the ball is sort of out. That's where the microphone can hear, okay, or see. Let's think of it more in terms of seeing. So a cardioid microphone can see what's in front of it and what's beside it, but it cannot see what's behind it. So if you've got a cardioid microphone, what you do with that is that you put, if you have to have a monitor speaker, which is usually what's feeding back, you put the monitor speaker behind the microphone. And that's why you see uh, singers will have a wedge microphone on the floor and they've got their microphone pointed at them like this, right? One thing they can do is to angle that microphone down so that the back of that microphone is pointing at the speaker because that microphone cannot hear anything that's coming from behind it. Now, sound is bouncing around the room, right? So you may have some sound reflecting around you. You can still get feedback on a cardioid microphone from something that's coming from behind it, but it's a lot less, okay? It's a lot less sensitive what's behind it. You'll notice a super cardioid microphone here can see what's in front of it and what's off, what, maybe what you're not seeing in that drawing is that, that bulb pattern that's in front of the microphone See, here's cardioid, supercardioid is a lot tighter, okay? So it, it can't see to, the, like a cardioid microphone can see to the sides really well, and it can see in front of it really well. So it can see all this here. Supercardioid microphone can see like this. Can't see to the sides real well. Can see in front of it real well, and it can see behind it a little bit. So if you're using side fill microphone, or if you're using side fill monitors, where you've got a monitor that's next to you, you can't see my hand. If it's if the monitor is next to you, a side fill, or maybe you've got an amplifier that's next to you, or maybe just the geometry of your stage, you want to have your your monitor is down on the floor next to you. Maybe a super cardioid microphone is going to be better for that because it cannot see or hear what's next to it as well as it can as what's in front of it. So if I'm singing into this thing, it can hear my voice, but if I step off axis that's going to drop a lot. So maybe that's a good thing. Uh, omnidirectional microphone. Yeah, if you've got feedback issues and you're using an omnidirectional microphone, you're going to be fighting that. There's, there's not anywhere to hide. An omnidirectional microphone can see in all directions. Now, why the heck would we use an omnidirectional microphone? Well, if you're in a bluegrass band and you got one microphone in the middle of the stage and we're all sort of huddled around this microphone, I might want an omnidirectional microphone so that it can equally hear or see all of us around this microphone. Okay, so there are different uses for these microphones, which is why there are different patterns. So knowing your mic pattern can help you position your speaker to reduce feedback. That's part of the input deal. With a cardioid microphone, you put the speaker directly behind the mic. Super cardioid, put it to the side. Omnidirectional, there's no safe place. Um, so how will I know what my microphone is? Usually around the microphone, right under the ball of the microphone, on the shaft, the parts you hold. Hey, by the way, if you're singing, you don't hold the ball of the microphone. You look like an idiot when you do that, and it sounds terrible. Um, I know everybody's like, man, I'm holding. Look at me, man. I'm gangster. Look how cool I am. No, you sound like an idiot because what happens when you put your hand over the ball of the microphone, it disrupts the way that they form these patterns, and that microphone, which used to be cardioid, is now omnidirectional. And so now it can hear behind itself, which it couldn't before, but be put clamping your hand around that thing changes it to omnidirectional, and it's going to be feeding back like crazy. Um, yes, 57s are cardioid. And the way you'll know, when you look at the ball, I, I went on a tangent there. Sorry, I step off my soapbox now. Um, when you when you look just below the, the ball of the microphone, you will see it'll say SM57, and then generally there'll be a little drawing, and it'll look like an upside-down heart. That's a cardioid pattern. In fact, that's why it's called cardioid, because it looks like a heart. Oh. So um, you'll generally see there will be a drawing of the pattern, or it'll say omni, or it'll say whatever um, on the mic. If you aren't sure, the Google knows everything. You can look it up and you go, hey, what is my SM7B? Uh, and it'll tell you. Okay. 
So back to our little drawing. My name is Simon. Okay, only certain people of a certain age will get that. Um, we're back to output. Okay, so here's our drawing. We got our four things. We talked about amplification and we talked about microphone or input. Um, so now we're going to talk about output. Um, output is the speaker, right? Or headphones or in ears. Sound is directional. You have to understand that sound is directional. Higher frequencies are highly directional. So you'll notice that when you're standing behind the mains, if we've got the main speakers pointing at the audience and you're standing behind those mains, you'll notice it doesn't sound real crisp. It's sort of, it's sort of, that's because the high frequencies, the ones where intelligibility are and crispness and definition, those are directional and they're headed away from you. They don't wrap around a whole lot. Lower frequencies are much less directional. In fact, we say bass, like anything under like 100 hertz, is almost omnidirectional. So yes, microphones have patterns, so do speakers. For speakers, however, it's really a function of frequency. So the higher the frequency, the more directional the sound is. This is why mics have to be behind the mains. That's why, you know, everybody, a lot of times you have people that are new to the amplified music business and they're like, I don't understand why we can have monitors and mains. Why do we have monitors and mains? We got two PA systems here. This is overly complicated. It makes no sense. Why don't we just put the main speakers behind us? We'll be able to hear. The audience will be able to hear. It'll be wonderful. A, you're going to go deaf. If you put the main speakers right behind you and you want people that are 100 feet away to be able to hear those well, you're going deaf and you're going deaf fast. Um, so that's bad. Um, and the other reason is if you have any microphones on stage, if the speakers are behind you and they're pointing right at the microphones, remember that cardioid pattern that the microphone can hear what's in front of it really well and the speakers are in front of it, whee, that's no good. Okay, so there's two reasons that we do that. There's two reasons we put the mains in front of the band and not behind the band. Uh, it's one so the band doesn't get their head taken off. And the other one is so it's not Feedback City. Historical fact. Um, the Grateful Dead uh, used to tour with a wall of sound is what they called it, the wall of sound. Um, and they did put the PA behind them on stage. They didn't even tour with a sound guy. This is how awesome this was. Each So the wall of sound was literally an entire wall of speakers, and it was God, probably 50 feet high. It was huge. Like sections of this are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, um, and they've got a whole drawing of this. The way the band was on stage, like where the keyboard player would stand, the section of the wall that was behind him was the keyboards. So it was his monitor, and he controlled the volume of that. Now, they had to be conscious of how they were blending, but basically, there, there was no monitor. So if he wanted to hear his keyboards, and he wanted to be able to hear the vocals and drums, which you kind of do if you're playing with people, you have to be able to hear them, then if he turned up too loud, then he couldn't hear them. So he would have to turn down a little bit in order to be able to hear them, and that's sort of what helped them create balance. Now, you're thinking, Matt just said you can't put the speakers behind the vocal mics, you're going to have Feedback City. That's true. The way around that is you do what they did, and they had two microphones, and one that the singer sang in, and there was one just below it that was listening to the mains, and they put them out of phase with each other. They, and we'll get to this. They put them out of phase with each other so that when the singer was singing into the top one, it was only hearing that. The bottom one was hearing, so the, sing, the, the top one was hearing the singer and the whole nonsense that was going on around him. The bottom one was only hearing the nonsense that was going on around him, not the singer because he wasn't singing into that mic. And then when they put them out of phase and mixed them together, you got the noise from the room and then you got out of phase noise from the room and they would cancel each other. So, and we will get to a discussion of this later. So they, they actually had to go to a lot of, a lot of trouble to stop the vocal mics from squealing because they had the mains behind them.
Okay? So it can be done, but you don't want to work that hard. They didn't want to work that hard either. They quit doing it. Um, so mics have to be behind the mains, mains facing away from you. Uh, monitors that you're listening to on the floor, if you're using wedge monitors, those should be as quiet as possible. I'm going to give you some tips on wedge monitors for those of you who are in bands and you're using wedge monitors. Put yourself in your wedge. That's it. That's the tweet. Just put yourself in your wedge and not anybody else. Unless you, not even unless. Don't put anything else in your wedge. Just put you in your wedge. Okay? Guitar player can be in his wedge. Bass player can be in his wedge. You're like, how am I going to hear anybody else? Well, you're going to listen for them and you're going to turn your wedge down so that you can hear them. If I've got my wedge and I've got singer in there, and drummer in there, guitar player in there, and fiddle player in there, and God knows what else in there, I've got to turn that thing up loud enough that I can hear everything I want to hear out of that wedge. Nope, I, I know I want to hear it from over there. I want to hear it from here. Well, that thing's going to be so stupid loud <coughs> because guess what? The singer who's standing right next to you, he wants the same thing. He wants to hear everything coming out of his wedge, too. So turn it up. I'm hearing a stupid fiddle player's wedge. Turn mine up until I can't hear his anymore. And next thing you know, it's 8 trillion decibels on stage. And the front of house guy just shuts his thing off and walks away. I've actually had to mix groups like this, that their monitors were so loud, we just shut the mains off. And people come back to me, don't you think the band's kind of loud? Yeah, I do think the band's kind of loud. Can you turn them down? I'm like, I turn them off. They're off. What you're hearing is what they're doing to themselves. I got no control over that. It's cool. I'm getting paid anyway. Um, so yeah, only put yourself in your monitor. Just don't put other people in your monitor. And get everybody else in your band to do the same thing. Because that way, you can all turn down a little bit. And then you won't have as much feedback. And you can actually listen to each other. You might start to play well. Um, so monitors should be as quiet as possible. Use a high pass filter on your monitors when you can. What the heck is that? A high pass filter is a thing that dumps all the low frequencies. What are you listening for on stage? You're listening for intelligibility and definition. All of those are in the high frequencies. You're like, well, there's no meat in my sound. You know what? You don't, you don't really need it to be able to hear yourself. The audience needs to hear it. You can deal with a little bit of a tinnier sound on stage if it helps the overall product, which it does. Remember we said that lower frequencies are less directional? So when that sound is coming out of your wedge, all the bright sparkly stuff that's coming at you that you need to be able to hear, all that low mushy stuff is A, getting in the way of that, and B, it's omnidirectional. So all that low frequency stuff is not just coming towards you, it's also going out into the audience. So the audience is sitting on the back side of your wedge, which means what are they hearing coming out of your wedge? Remember what you're hearing coming out of the mains? What they're hearing coming out of the wedge is... So guess what the front of house guy has to do to compensate for that? He's got to start making everything real bright and sparkly in the mains to overcome all the woofiness that's coming off of the stage. And next thing you know, the violinist goes, holy crap, my tone, th this engineer doesn't know how to mix violins. They sound really bright and piercing. Maybe, maybe your wedge is too loud and there's too much woof in your wedge. If you turn all that down, turn your wedge down, high pass your wedge so that there's only like mids and highs coming out of that wedge, then you want all this woof going out front that your front of house engineer has to compensate for you, and he's going to compensate by making you really screechy sounding. It's going to sound okay to the audience because they're still getting that bottom end. It's just going the wrong way. Um, just a thought. Um, so use a high pass on the monitors whenever possible. It helps you. It helps your sound engineer. Um, point the monitors at your head, not at your microphone. And I know that if you're a singer, your head and your microphone are pretty much in the same spot, but not necessarily. Okay, so if there is a difference between where your head is and where the mic is, say when you're singing, you're up on your mic. But if you step back to play 
And what you really need to hear yourself in your mic is your violin, or in your monitor is your violin. Point the monitor at where your head's going to be when you're playing. Instead of at your mic, maybe you get a little less feedback, right? And then the last thing is maybe put the monitors in your ears and not on the floor. Let's talk about that some. In-ear monitors are a fantastic solution to feedback. If you've got a wedge and you've got a microphone on your violin and it's feeding back between that microphone and the wedge, one way to get rid of that feedback is to go to in-ear monitors. So the monitors, instead of sitting on the floor and blasting sound into, into the room, they're sitting inside your ears and they're just pumping sound into your skull. They can protect your hearing because generally these, these little speakers are behind like earplugs. So they put you put earplugs in your ears and then the speakers go through the earplugs. So you're you're knocking down like all this cymbal splashing and all these massive crowds that are screaming your name, Gary, Gary, Gary. Your name's not even Gary, but that's what they're chanting. Um, so all the massive crowds shooting, you know, screaming at you, at least they used to be four months ago. Um, and all the, the loud sound on stage, you don't have to hear that anymore. All you got to hear is what's being piped in. So it protects your hearing. It reduces feedback in your channel because it's possible for your in-ears to feed back through your mic, but they would have to be so insanely loud. Um, it reduces monitor wars like we talked about, <coughs> where you've got your mic. That's not the Rona, I promise. So you've got your, you know, you got your monitor cranked up and the drummer's got his monitor cranked up. I can't hear. All I can hear is a bass player's monitor. Turn mine up. So if you've got them in your ears, there's no more monitor wars. It reduces feedback. The overall volume of your band can come down. Remember I said a lot of times the monitors are so loud that the front of house guy can just turn his thing off and walk away, which means the overall volume can come down. The overall mix, the quality of that can go up. It's a better audience experience. More people are going to pay to hear you play. That's a good thing. So think really hard about in-ears. Um, processing. We talked about input. We talked about output. We talked about amplification. The fourth piece, processing. This is the money piece, right? Amplification is easy. We just turn down and feedback's going to go away, right? You don't need a PhD for that. The microphone. Let's pick the right. Uh, let's pick the right pattern of our mic. Let's get the right speaker location. These are all things that you know. That it ain't hard to do this. Once you know, you've watched me talk for what 31 minutes now, and you know how to do all of that. You know how to point your speakers better. You know how to get your mic set up better. You know how to turn down. You already know all this. So the processing is the money part. This is where it gets a little more more trickier, like talking American is tricky. Um, so this is where the money is. You use this after you've done what you can with amplification, after you've done with input devices, after you've done with output devices, making sure you're using in-ears where possible. This is, this is where after we've done all that other stuff, now we come to the processing. A lot of people go straight to EQ right off the bat. Oh, I hear feedback. feedback we, or, I can't even talk. I'm so excited. Glad you guys are here. Um, so yeah, a lot of people they hear, woo, they're like, oh, EQ, I got to run to the EQ. No, that's last. Turn it down if you can. Make sure your input and output devices are not fighting against you. Then we go to the EQ. Okay. So your first weapon after volume, and that's part of processing, is EQ. So it's generally going to feed back at a specific frequency. So you hear, woo. Okay, well, what's that frequency? It's about 400 hertz. How do I know that? Because I've been doing this a long time. Um, what you can do is you can know that your open A string is 440 hertz. If the feedback is lower than that, it's less than 440. If the feedback is higher than that, it's more than 440. Also know that my A string is 440. Half of that is 220. Well, that's an octave down from open A. So that means first finger on the G string for violinist. If you're a cellist, now it's your open A is 220. So if, if I think in terms of, of A, I got open A for the violinist 440. First finger on the G string, that's 220. OK, 
Okay, now I'm, I'm starting to find where these frequencies are. And then I put my third finger on the E string. That's an octave up from A, 440. That's now 880. So, wow, we're starting to get some landmarks here. So once you find, you hear that frequency, you can sort of go, okay, where is it versus 220, 440, and 880? Now I can, okay, maybe it's, you know, it's a little higher than 880. Maybe it's 1,000. It's at 1K. I don't know. So let's try this. Let's go to the graphic EQ, the 31-band EQ. If you have an open speaker on stage, there needs to be a 31-band EQ associated with that speaker. If you guys have digital boards, a lot of time that's inside the digital board. Um, <clears throat> old school, we used to actually have a physical 31-band EQ, usually a one-rack space or two-rack space item. It had 31 little faders on it, hence the name, 31-band EQ. So you go and you go, okay, we're roughly 1K. So what am I going to do? Am I going to turn that down? Nope. I'm actually going to turn it up. He's going to do what? Yes. You turn it up. So if you hear the feedback, it's feeding back. Woo! I'm going to go to right where I think that is, and I'm going to turn that frequency up. Now, pretty quick. If I turn that frequency up and nothing changes, that ain't it. So pick another one. And Okay, I turn this one up. Whoa, that feedback got a lot worse. <laughs> Found it. So now you dump that. So that's how you do it. You go, you guess what feed, you guess what frequency it is. Turn that frequency up on your 31 band. If it makes the feedback worse, you found it. If it doesn't make it worse, that isn't it. Put it back where you found it and move on to the next frequency. What you might have to do is sometimes a, a feed, a frequency will start going. We'll say it's 440 hertz. For grins because your open a strings going nuts on you when when i i raise that up yep feedback got worse and i dumped that now i got to start looking for multiples of that frequency because sometimes i will hear that 440 but what's behind it is also some 880 feeding back or some 1.7k is starting to feed back so i may get that first one if it's still going, I may be able to find it in the uh, in the multiples of that frequency, either half, 2x, 4x, whatever. If you have multiple frequencies that are feeding back, you're hearing several tones going all at once, you have an equipment issue or you have a volume issue, and it's time to go back to those other three things, input, output, volume, okay? Um, you know, it's not uncommon to maybe have two or three problematic frequencies. If you've got like six or eight problematic frequencies, you've got bigger problems than trying to find these on an EQ, and you should deal with those other bigger problems. Um, so let's find some of these frequencies. What are these frequencies? I told you the A string trick. Um, sometimes you'll hear, and it's like a roar, and it'll take off. It's like this low thing, right? That's generally below 100 hertz. Um, and we would generally attack that with a high pass filter <clears throat> because those frequencies, they get crazy, man. If you've got a low frequency roar, um, really the best way to attack that is with a high pass filter. And we talked about that. Um, if it's like a hoot or a howl somewhere that's in like the G, D, A string range on your violin, that's going to be 250 to 500 hertz. If you've got like when I'm singing, if I've got like a singing sound, um, that's going to be around 1K. If I'm starting to get a, a whistle, that's going to be in the 2 to 4K range. And if I if it starts screeching or screaming like this, somebody's ice picking you in your head, that's going to be like 4K plus. Um, I had a microphone. When I was a trumpet player for a long time, and I had a microphone that clipped onto my trumpet, and it was this super high-pitched squeal, like super high-pitched. And it was just super sensitive at around 10K. So I just knew every time we went to a festival or something, when we're plugging in, I would tell the sound guy, hey, this particular mic, it just, it goes crazy to about 10K. So if I were you, I'd sort of pull out some 8, some 10, some 12K. It's going to be fine. All right, so we'll do that. Once you start to learn what the tendencies of your equipment are, then you can talk to the engineers that you work with and not go, well, I don't know if he's back a lot. Uh, he's going to go, oh, this is going to be a fun day. Uh, but if you tell them, hey, generally uh, this violin does like to feed back around 1K, 
hey, thanks, bro. If it starts feedback, I'll know right where to go. So um, that's helpful. Um, like I said, um, th these are some frequency notes or some frequencies on your uh, on your different notes that you got on your violin. Let's talk about wavelength. Each frequency has a wavelength associated with that frequency. And what that does, you know, with the sound looks like sort of a sine wave. Um, your open G, 196 hertz, is the fundamental frequency of that sound. Now, obviously, there are overtones above that. But 196 hertz is the fundamental frequency of your open G string. That wavelength is 69 inches long. So from, from, from peak to peak of that wave is 69 inches, okay? Open A is about 31 inches, open E is about 20 inches, and then the octave E, hey, looky there, an octave, double the frequency, half the wavelength. Math is crazy, right? So that 1.3 kilohertz, that 1.3K, is a 10 inch, 10 inch wavelength. It's 10, it's 10 inches, 10 inches, from peak to peak of that wave. So think about this. If I'm standing, if I'm standing 50 inches away from my monitor, there are five full wavelengths between me and that monitor. Okay? Let's let's go, let's think about this. If you know that each frequency has a wavelength and you're getting feedback at a frequency that you're not having any luck getting rid of, you can move your input or output a few inches and change the system response. If I'm at 1.3K, wavelength is 10 inches. And so I've got, I'm getting feedback at 1.3K. If I move half of that wavelength, if I move five inches, I'm going to start creating destructive interference. So instead of the peak coming out of the speaker and the peak coming out of my violin at the same time, if I move five inches, now by the time that thing gets here, now it's at a valley. So I've got a peak coming out of the violin hitting a valley coming out of the speaker. Feedback goes away. So it's one of those things if you've got a microphone and a speaker and you're getting some feedback, and gosh, even EQ is not having a lot of luck with this, I can move, I can change the distance between the input and the output where I'm getting my feedback. If I change the distance, sometimes I can create destructive interference in that frequency range. And, and you may only have to move a couple inches. The higher the frequency is, the shorter these wavelengths get. You know, if we're up at 2.6 kilohertz, if it's, it's, if it's pretty screechy sound and feedback, your wavelength is only five inches. So if you move two inches back, if you just, just push that speaker two inches away from you, that's enough to flip the phase on that wave, and it's enough to really work a lot of good in the whole area of um, feedback reduction. So what does constructive versus de destructive interference look like? So let's look at wave number one and two. On the, uh, it'll be on the left-hand side where it says constructive. So we add those two together, right? Because you're making the sound from your violin and then the sound from the speaker's coming out. Now it's twice as high, right? But if we flip that, if I add a, a half a wavelength of distance between me and the source, now destructive interference, whoop, goes away like magic. Um, so there, besides changing the distance between me and the speaker, you know, because sometimes I'm moving around, right? I'm not a stationary dude, even when I'm doing these things. I'm not a stationary dude. Uh, rock and roll involves, you know, movement. Um, so maybe like finding a safe place and then locking myself in a position there, that ain't really the answer. Um, there's a thing called a phase button. There's a picture of a, a Fisherman Loudbox artist. There's a little button there called phase. Um, you can push that button. And what it'll do is it will flip the, it's actually polarity, um, um, but it will flip the phase or polarity of your signal. So um, what that's going to do is basically turns your signal upside down so that instead of getting constructive interference, now you're getting destructive interference. And that's mo better if you're trying to keep feedback down. You might even see it uh, labeled as a Greek letter phi. So you see like a, it'll look like a circle with a line through it. 
Um, sometimes they do that hat, that slash would be this way. Sometimes it's vertical. Um, they think they're getting all they're getting all fancy by making it italics. They put it to the side. Now it's confusing because it just looks like a zero. But that's the Greek letter phi, phi, f, phase. How clever. <laughs> um, so that's what's going on there. So if you see that button, you know, because normally you're messing around with your amp. You're like, man, I pushed the phase button and it didn't sound any different. That's a pointless button. Stupid. I can't believe I paid for that. <sighs> Corporate America trying to rip me off. Um, no, that's actually what that button's for. So if you got some feedback issues and you just can't get it to go away, you can try using the polarity or the phase button. And, uh, and that's sort of one of your secret weapons. Um, so here's what it does. See the red? You got the red line there where it's up and then down and up and down. And up, you know. uh, what, what a phase button does is it flips that. So that instead of having your, your where it goes up and then down, it goes down and up, right? So that can help, uh, you know, make things better. Um, you got to be a little careful when using a phase button, especially if you're capturing audio from more than one source. If you're one of those guys that you like using a pickup and a mic on your violin, and you're going to let the sound guy blend them, uh, if you hit the phase button on one of those two, well, now your violin and your microphone are out of phase with each other, and that's bad. Because remember, destructive, you know, it does cut down on feedback. You know what else it cuts down on? Everything. So it used to be that, hey, I could actually hear my violin. It sounded really nice. If I flipped a phase on one of them, crap, where did everything go? It just all went away. Um, you actually would need to flip the phase on both of them um, in order to get your sound back. So, oh, or if you're a drummer... Uh, this is a really common thing that uh, sound guys will use if if, uh, if I'm using two mics on the kick drum or two mics on the snare drum and like I gosh I keep turning the kick drum up and it's it's just there's nothing there I'm probably those two are out of phase so say if I've got the inside mic is is 12 inches from the beater head and the outside mic is 24 inches from the beater head um, I've, they could actually be out of phase, out of phase with each other okay so, um, yeah, if you just have one mic or one pickup on your violin or you're talking about a vocal mic, that phase, which is really polarity, um, that button can be a very useful tool. All right. So that is kind of my primer, like a 40 minute primer on feedback. If you have dealt with feedback, you know my pain. Uh, if you haven't dealt with feedback, you're gonna at some point if you're in an amplified music setting you're gonna deal with feedback at some point so remember it's like the fire triangle except it's four so it's like a fire quadrilateral uh the feedback quadrilateral i should patent that or trademark it or something um input output amplification processing uh we go after input output amplification first and then deal with processing issues so um i hope that's helpful to you guys um, yeah, so I am, uh, I'm headed to the beach in the next few minutes because guys who look like me spend a lot of time laying in the sun. No, no, I will be, uh, inside. My family will be on the beach. I'll be inside, uh, editing a, another rock star violinist podcast for you guys. And I cannot wait for you to hear who it is. Tell you what, there's only a few of us here. I'll tell you who it is. It's Daniel Bernard Remain. That's who I'm editing this week, and his episode should be out very soon. He and I had a great chat. Um, uh, we did this chat, uh, I guess, sort of the tail end of June, right in the middle of all the, the protest, which a lot of the protests are still going on, but June, gosh, was just such a heavy month, man. Um, so, yeah, we talked about the protest. We talked about black composers. We talked about... Uh, uh, black players in the classical world. We talked about uh, getting outside the classical world. We uh, talked about his his composing and his songwriting and his playing and his life. Uh, it was a really, really I say fun chat. It was really informative and really inspiring. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy it a lot. We're going to mix a bunch of his music into here too. So um, yes, Daniel Bernard Romain, DBR. My interview with him comes out um, as soon as I can get it edited. So 
uh, maybe in the next three or four days. Uh, you should you should see that. So uh, yeah, Rockstar Violinist Podcast. If you if you haven't started listening to those, this will be episode fifty one. So you could start listening to the previous episodes, and maybe by the time you have listened to all 50, uh, I'll have this one edited. Um, the most recent one was Brian King Joseph. The guy that was on America's Got Talent a couple years ago. Um, everybody was oh, he's a reality guy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he's a Berkeley guy. He went to Berkeley. He can actually play. Um, and he's really, really smart, and he thinks really hard about what he's playing and what his music is. And he's got some hilarious stories about being on America's Got Talent. He's got some hilarious stories. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, he's now released another original song, but his first original song that came out, um, the video featured him playing his Aurora violin underwater with the lights on. That was pretty awesome. It turns out he can't swim. Um, so yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm going to shoot this video underwater and failed to tell the video crew that he doesn't know how to swim, uh, which they discovered when they dropped him into the water and then like, oh, crap, this guy's not coming up. We should totally rescue him. Yeah, good stories. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, enjoy that episode. Enjoy the Brian King Joseph episode. The one before that was um, Jimmy Mattingly, who plays with Garth and Reba and Dolly. Um, I feel like that's a that's a good enough resume. You know, You got my attention. Um, so yeah, Jimmy Mattingly and Brian King Joseph are the last two that you could listen to and, uh, you know, whatever, there's 50 of them. So enjoy them and I'll get DBR edited down in the next few days and get that out to you. You guys enjoy. Hopefully when you see me next, uh, I'm not going to look like I'm uh, medium rare. I will have talked my way out of laying on the beach a lot and, uh, yes. Okay. Next.